Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, Joanne, do we have any apologies? None. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I'll just read you some housekeeping rules. Um, I'm, I'm, to introduce myself, I'm Lynn Stagg, Cabinet Member for Traffic and Transportation. If the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use lifts. Please assemble at Queen Victoria's statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with Portsmouth Cultural Trust fire marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should remember to sign up when leaving the building after today's meeting. Otherwise, they'll be looking for you in case you lost. Um, may I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed or filmed from a camera at a fixed location at the back of the meeting room, meeting room and the recording will be on the Council's website. The camera will mainly capture the backs of anyone making deputations, but there will be some footage of them as they approach and leave the table where the microphones are located and of people entering or leaving the room while the meeting is in progress. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupt, disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please can everyone remember to use the microphones provided when they are speaking and it's the button on the right. Um, does anybody wish explicitly not to be filmed? Okay, thank you. Take it that that's fine. Right, let's introduce ourselves. As I said, I'm Lynn Stagg, Cabinet Member. I'm Councillor Graham Heaney, Councillor Mr. Jude Ward and the Labour Spokesman on Traffic and Transportation. Councillor Simon Bosch, a Conservative Spokesman. Wayne Layton, Finance Manager for Portson City Council. Michelle Love, Safer Travel Manager for Portsmouth City Council. Uh, Nikki Musson, Parking Team, Portsmouth City Council. Kevin McKee, Parking Manager, Portsmouth City Council. Hayley Trower, Air Quality for Transport. Pam Tatum, Assistant Director of Transport. Gerald Moore Smith, Democratic Services. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, shall we start with? Oh no, um, declarations of members' interests. Any interest pertinent to this meeting? Just one query. I'm, I work at the university, and we're talking about university students having permits. I don't have an interest in the issue, as far as I'm concerned. Um, no problem. It's up to the member to decide if it is, but it shouldn't be a pecuniary one to you. So. I wouldn't have thought that was uh, um, declarable interest. <laughs> right. Thank you, everybody. Right. Um, item number one, which is TRO 18B to 2019 Parking Restriction Proposals, Cobden Avenue, Holland Road, Dryden Avenue, Winter Road. Um, and who is speaking on this? Is it Nikki? Oh, Kevin. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Um, a number of proposals relating to parking restrictions are put forward throughout each year um, via TROs. And these are made in response to concerns about road safety or traffic management or to accommodate an identified need. Uh, they are received from residents, councillors, emergency services and public services. Um, when objections are received to the council's proposals, a report to the cabinet member is required for a decision to be made at a public meeting. Uh, during the 21-day public consultation on the proposals under TRO 18 stroke 2019, objections were received to four out of the 25 proposals. These relate to Cobden Avenue, Holland Road, Dryden Avenue and Winter Road. Uh, the full details are contained within the report and so to summarise, the report carries the following recommendations in light of the information provided by local people. Uh, 2.1 the 12 metre length of double yellow line in Cobdean Avenue outside numbers 49 to 53 is not removed as proposed and therefore remains in place. 2.2, uh, uh, the 16 metres of double yellow line proposed at the western end of Holland Road are not installed. 2.3, uh, as proposed, double yellow lines are installed on the south side of Dryden Avenue the existing disabled bays are relocated to the north side and the proposed disabled bay is installed on the north side with white line markings applied in front of the steps on the north side. And 2.4, 
as proposed, double yellow lines are reinstated in place of the 23 metres of a yellow line in Winter Road between Wimborne Road and Evans Road. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, have you, um, councillors, have you got any comments? Oh, it, no, there are no... Um, no, no requests for deputations on this side. No. Good, thank you. Any comments um, or questions from councillors? Okay, thank you. Well, I think that goes. Um, we accept those proposals. And the next one is item number four is TRO 57, stroke 2019, parking restriction proposals, um, Martin Road, Maidford Grove, and Watermead Road. Um, is that you again, Karen? Deputations. Um, who's making a deputation? Would you like to come to the table in front? Thank you. Um, and can you introduce yourself to us? Yes, yeah. I press the switch on here. It needs to it needs to be recorded, so okay, right. Yeah, yes. right. Thank, you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Hang on a minute. Um, the officer, uh, Kevin, will, will um, introduce the, um, okay. the TRO. Thank you. Uh, very similar to the last one. Um, during the 21-day public consultation uh, on this proposal, objections were received to three out of the 16 proposals. Uh, these relate to Martin Road, Mayford Grove and Watermead Road. Full details are contained within the report. And so to summarise, the report carries the following recommendations in the light of the information provided by local people. Uh, 2.1, the 11 metre length of double yellow line in Martin Road in front of the shared driveway and number 55 is not removed as proposed and therefore remains in place. 2.2, 34 metres of double yellow line proposed on one side of Mayford Grove are installed. Uh, 2.3 of the 67 metres of double yellow line proposed in Watermead Road, only the following are installed. Uh, a west side, a 5 metre length north and south of the junction with sandpipers, and B, east side, 8 metres of the proposed 38 metres is installed northwards of number 1. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Now, is it Mr White, is it? Yes. Uh, would you like to go ahead now? Thank White. you. My wife and I moved into number one Watermead Road in June 2018 and since then there has been a noticeable increase in the parking of vehicles, particularly commercial vehicles on the east side between Old Farmway and our house, the part of the road under discussion today. The whole length of the road I refer to is at present available for parking and as such vehicles are free to park within a yard of our driveway exit almost adjacent to our white line denoting the drive entrance. This causes a particular problem for us when high-sided vehicles choose to park there. They do so in order to eliminate difficult parking manoeuvres when they themselves have to move. It obviously prevents them from having to shunt between other vehicles, so it has become a favourite place to park. We have had skip lorries and large trucks park there for some days at a time, particularly at weekends and holiday times when they are out of use for long periods. There is one large van some eight feet high and six feet wide that is often there for weeks at a time without moving. We have observed that the owner lives in the flats at Sandpipers. The result of this close proximity parking to our driveway is that we have a serious issue of restricted view regarding vehicles coming at speed onto Watermead Road past those that are parked on this east side stretch. This not only applies to us, but to our neighbours at numbers three and five, who have concerns for the same reason. I believe Mrs Spencer has uh, submitted an email uh, even this morning regarding her concern. Uh, we have had several near misses with cars, motorcycles and other vehicles because as we edge out of our drive, we are unable to see anything coming until we're on the same side of the road that they are, which is effectively the wrong side for coming south down Watermead Road. I realised that a full restriction of parking that was uh, originally um, uh, suggested 
uh, on the east side would lead to other problems if parking was then encouraged to the west side exiting sandpipers would then be subject to similar issues that we have however I would very much like to see a short restricted length of road such as being proposed with double yellow lines immediately adjacent to our drive on the east side that would allow us to view clearly any oncoming vehicles as we exit. It would almost certainly eliminate any accident that will surely occur involving us if the present situation continues. Each of us is only as safe as the worst driver on the road. Near misses encountered at our drive entrance have prompted us to make this request for a change for better vision splay on the east side as proposed. Not just for our sakes, but for any visitors that we may have that are unfamiliar with our situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Kevin, have you got any comments to make on that, or, or Nikki? Uh, yeah, um, as um, Mr. White, were you Mr. White? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> said we put forward this proposal at, at your request for the reasons that you've explained. Um, and I think the recommendations reflect what you, you'd like to see, if that's all right, yeah? That's right, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We don't normally put in W lines just to improve visibility from exiting driveways because obviously there's hundreds across the city. Um, but I think this will probably benefit the wider community as well if if we manage the parking in a small way, perhaps not as, as dramatically as we first proposed, which was the junctions as well. Um, we had we actually had six objections to the proposal um, from residents of Watermead Road and further into the estate. And it would appear that the recommendations um, are probably the most satisfactory for everyone um, as an outcome. So those those are the recommendations. Thanks. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Councillor Heaney, Councillor Bosher, either of you. Any comments? Uh, th thank you, Chairman. It's it's my ward, and I think it's fair to say that um, <clears throat> the uh, old farm way area or, or to use the, the local phrase, the bird estate, because they're all bird names up in that neck of the woods, has suffered over the years with parking issues, particularly from Fitzherbert Road Industrial Estate um, uh, that we actually have there, and also what was the old Julius Meller site, which is now called Fair, Fairways, I, I believe, which is on the junction. It, it's, it, it's literally sort of at 10 o'clock from your little map, if you know what I mean, which is a big housing estate that was, that was built a few years ago, but it's one of those where it's a private estate. So you've all got an allocated parking space and it's uh, a private company that actually police the parking there. So any visitors, they've got nowhere else to park, so they hop across the road into Old Farm Way and Watermead tends to be the closest because there is a walk through there. It, it, there is an ongoing problem because it's largely um, uh, a one-in, one-out estate, but we do need to strike a balance, and, and as Mr. White has said, because I think, uh, if, if memory serves me, Mr. White, you actually, they're actually recessed back, there's a, there's a, a recessed area yeah. in which is actually shown there, and it does make it quite difficult to actually access it in and out. So. I think what Nikki is proposing seems to be a good halfway house for the area, but I, I suspect that the the nature of the estate and, and what it is and what's beside it, it probably won't be the last time that, that parking issues particularly come up, because I do notice that some of the, um, the deputations have actually mentioned it being a residence parking zone area. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, but I think what Nicky's actually proposed, um, from my perspective, is, is, a, is a good midway solution. Thank you, Councillor Bursher. As it's your ward, you know it better than, than certainly I do. Can I suggest that, that perhaps we review it in, in six months' time to see if there's any, I mean, to go ahead with it and see if there, if there are any continuing problems? Um, yes, of course. If we get any report, reports um, even sooner than that, we can certainly look at, at changes. Does, is that okay with you, Mr. Mr. White? Yes, yes, a good compromise. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much for your help. That's thank right, you. thank you. In that case, I think all three of those are okay. Here you go. Pardon?
No, it's okay. I'm, I'm obviously cats are both. Oh, sorry. I'm, so I'm fine with it. I'm, if, if I want to say anything, I shall shout. Don't worry. Okay, I, d I did ask. Well, I. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, the, ri the written deputation is from Mr. White, isn't it? No, it's from his Oh, is it? Oh, my apologies. I took it to mean. Right. Um, shall I read this out? Um, I just wanted to make you aware of the written deputation that's been circulated yeah, yeah, quite. to people for, um, for reading. There's one thing that, that I have highlighted here, and I think that's the last one paragraph, which says, I, we have recently had refuse collection lorries unable to exit the estate due to vehicles being parked on both sides, also large del delivery vehicles from DFS, builders, merchants, and breakdown vehicles. So hopefully this will um, alleviate that problem if people observe the double yellow lines. Um, and that's always open to question, isn't it? Okay. Thank you. My apologies. I, I did think it was Mr. Mr. White. Right. Item number five. Um, speed reduction Locksway Road. And who is introducing this? Ah, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stagg. Um, so the purpose of the report that we've brought to you today is um, in the local transport plan three implementation plan 2018-19 funding was allocated for speed reduction schemes um, and the aim of the project was that it was to be responsive to residents speeding concerns and to introduce traffic calming at a variety of locations across the city so that was approved in uh, March 2018 and following on from that um, with the analysis of speed data and also obviously resident correspondence and councillor correspondence it was decided to put uh, speed cushions along Locksway Road in the Milton Ward. The reason behind this was because when we analysed the data, Locksway Road has a 20 mile an hour speed limit, um, but the variance is in within the top 10% of the city. So obviously it's, uh, the abo it's above average. The speed is higher than 20 miles an hour. Um, in fact, it's 29 miles an hour. So that's the average speed along Locksway Road. Um, that's 85% of the vehicles are travelling around 29 miles an hour. And also we've had seven incidents in the last five years, five slight incidents and two serious incidents. So um, we designed a scheme, put it out to consultation, and the purpose of the report today is the fact that we received some objections about that consultation, and we've brought those here today. So I'll just run through, obviously it's all available um, within the meeting pack, but I will run through briefly what the uh, scope of the objections were. So there were objections to the location of the speed humps because people asked for more um, and actually two additional sets have now been added um, with the use of some community infrastructure levy funding. Um, other people asked for speed cameras, however um, this is not the type of road that it is. Uh, we wouldn't put speed cameras <coughs> down this road, it would be traffic calming measures instead. Um, Anti-skid was requested, but because it's not coming up to a junction or a roundabout, that's not appropriate. Um, there were concerns about the type of speed cushions, so obviously driving over them, um, would it cause damage to the underside of vehicles? The answer is, is that these speed cushions are made of a rubberized material and screwed onto the surface of the road, and so there is a lot more give in them than standard concrete constructed speed humps. Um, and obviously there was an objection to say that Locksway Road was too busy for speed cushions, but obviously the response to that was that the reason we're doing it is in order to slow that volume of traffic down. Um, so that's a brief run through of the objections. Um, let me just go through. Yeah, I've covered all of those. So within the, the report, we've taken into account those objections and answered them fully. Um, and having assessed those and looked at the data again, we still believe that the installation of traffic calming measures in the form of speed cushions in this case is the most appropriate. Um, way of achieving the speed reduction measures that we set out within the local transport plan. So we would like to ask for approval to continue with this scheme. 
thank you, Michelle. Well, I know Luxor Road quite, quite quite well. It's it's a long straight road, and well, it, it's got a few bends, but not too many. And cars do go speeding down there. This I know this is anecdotal. Um, one or two points I, I'd like to make. It says about somebody uh, you said about um, better sign your speed cameras, uh, enforcement of the 20 mile no limit. I know you've mentioned the police, but the police won't actually enforce the 20 mile an hour limit. The, ACPO, the Association of Chief Police Officers, won't do it. I've had battles with them for many years over that. But they will come in and do education and enforcement um, days. Um, yeah, we do work closely with colle uh, colleagues in Hampshire Constabulary when we are doing some speed enforcement um, behavioural change campaigns within the city. Yeah. And uh, then there's mention about the speed cushions outside in Eisenbach Brunel Road, which were actually put in by the developers, weren't they? And they were causing major problems, but they have now been um, changed. They weren't put in by Portsmouth City Council. And they're actually okay now? Uh, no, they were put in by RGB Group with the um, construction of Chaucer House, turning it into student flats. Um, and yes, we did receive complaints about the speed cushion because it was taking the bottom of vehicles, damaging the bottom of vehicles, and that was changed in February of this year, and it was lowered. Uh, Last point is it says uh, some uh, emergency vehicles, the potential for damage to car suspension. Not if they're going at the 20 miles, no, it won't. So that's, I think, the message to get out to people. You won't damage your cars um, if you go at the right speed. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Heaney. I should get used to doing this eventually. Um, the point of clarification, uh, the emergency services, including fire and ambulance, do they... Are they consulted about this and do they have any views about speed bumps because obviously it potentially could affect their time to get to someone. Do they have any issues with it? Um, yes, they are consulted and um, within more, the most, more recent installation of speed pumps have been these the rubberized ones. Yep. So there's a lot more give within it. Um, so yes, if, if these aren't going to be um, raised tables that cover the entire width of the road, they're going to be individual square speed humps, one in each side of the carriageway, which means if the emergency services are driving defensively, they will simply just drive around them. So, yeah, yeah. Councillor Bosher. Perhaps, on the, perhaps uh, more, more um, general comment, uh, Michelle. At some point you mentioned Loxway Road is in the top 10% the speed. Is that the top 10% of 20 mile an hour roads in the city or the top 10% as in from a speed data point of view? So it's from a speed data point of view. So when we do speed data surveys, um, the actual calculation is what we call a V85. So that basically means that um, it's, it's the average speed of 85% of the vehicles or more is above what we want it to be and Loxway Road is in the top 10% of those roads that has that. Anything else? No. Um, I've got one question um, and that's in, in one of the um, objections, I oh, oh, it's a question. For the benefit of cyclists I would like the speed bumps to be clear of the curb by five metres to enable us a safety margin. This is the cyclist. Is there enough room to do that? No. I don't think that the, uh, the roads in Portsmouth were wise enough to do that. So what will be the distance? They'll be approximately 1 to 1.5 metres away from the kerb. It's not very much, is it, for, for cyclists, but I suppose there's no alternative. If the road isn't wide enough, you can't do anything about it. The road itself is between 8 to 9 metres wide, so if we had a 5 metre gap, we'd have one speed hump in the middle of the carriageway, which wouldn't really achieve what we were trying to do. Um, and obviously with the speed hump regulations, um, there is a, you can have them, because of the size of them, and because they are actually made of a more absorbent material, it's quite possible for a cyclist to ride over the top or ride... And we suggest a position of taking up the middle of the carriageway lane. So rather than have them at the curb, we would want them in the centre. And then they can simply ride over the speed hump the way that anyone else would. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to um, agree to that. I think it's a sensible move. I'll just ask a question. Again, it's a general question, Michelle, because you've used the, the phrase absorbent quite a lot with regards to these speed humps which suggests there is a lot of give in them as you go over. 
So therefore, the heavier your vehicle, the less the impact is going to be. So therefore, the simple question I've got on that is, what sort of guarantee that they are going to be useful if you've got, if the fact that a heavy vehicle drives over them and doesn't even know that they're there? So they're still constructed to the speed hump um, regulations. There's actually an, like an act for them in their own right. I was really impressed. Um, but also, <laughs> um, we have prior, so these aren't, these are tried and tested within the city. So if you go out on Twism by Brunel Road, you'll see them by um, Charter Academy. If you go to Knowlesley Road, they're on a bus route. So we already have proven sites where the data shows that the average speed slows down. And obviously, Knowlesley Road is a bus route, and Ism by Brunel Road road has just been the the route to a major construction site so the, with the data that we have already with them on site in the city we're confident that they will achieve what they need to achieve so you're relying on the fact that they are a visible deterrent as well yeah well they are pink aren't they so right, right, they, yeah. yeah yeah so they do stand out quite a bit Anyway, I'm quite happy for yes, that. Go ahead. Oh, are they? Right. I'm, I wasn't responsible for this. <laughs> Item number six, which is safer routes to school. Is this you again, Michelle? Oh, um, Councillor Symes. No, 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 sorry, no. Councillor Stubbs. Sorry. I wasn't confusing you, Linda, honestly. <laughs> um, Right. Is it you, Michelle? Um, so the report that we're bringing now is Safer Routes to School, the Albert Road Zebra Crossing. Um, so again, the original funding was agreed in March 2018 in the Local Transport Plan 3, and it falls within the budget, within the scheme of Safer Routes to School which was an area-wide program that could, where the funding could be spent in any of the wards and it allows reactive works on school routes um, uh, as issues are identified by residents and councillors. So um, the it, decision was made to construct the zebra crossing at Albert Road because uh, in August 2017, Craneswater Junior School, where the zebra crossing is located adjacent to, um, were approved planning permission to construct a new single-storey reception area, uh, two classrooms, and basically re, uh, rework the entire way that the pupils entered and left the school. So the pupils, instead of leaving out mostly onto St Ronan's Road, now left out onto Albert Road. So funding was, uh, a design was drawn up to ensure that these pupils now coming out onto Albert Road obviously had a safe place to cross over Albert Road immediately in front of them. Um, and Craneswater has a capacity of 480 pupils and currently has 442 on roll. So they are, they're quite near full. Um, so the purpose of the report is the fact that we put out consultation letters in February 2019 and we received objection, some objections to those, that consultation. So we've brought those objections here in order to gain approval to carry on with the scheme. So some of the objections were that, um, I'll just summarise them again, obviously they are all available within the um, meeting pack. And um, a lot of them are centred around the fact that there are other zebra crossings on Albert Road, and yes, that's absolutely true. There are other zebra crossings along the entirety of the road, um, but there is not one that is directly accessible by the school itself. Um, and the current school site, so obviously the, when the entrances changed, we saw a, a greater increase in the number of children crossing directly over Albert Road. Um, some of the other objections cited the fact that we have a zebra cross, uh, school crossing patroller, a lollipop person, that already works outside Craneswater Junior School. And the response to that was, um, if we build an engineered crossing, we then take the school crossing patroller off that site and move them to another site in the area where obviously the need is still as great. So we would be freeing up the school crossing patroller that works on that site to move to a different site within the area. Um, there were objections about the fact that the zebra crossing would result in poor driving, encouraging last minute braking and over acceleration in between the zebra crossings. And um, our response to that was that obviously we would 
always look to promote positive driver behaviour and adherence to the highway code and we would work with our colleagues in Hampshire Constabulary in order to monitor the site once it's complete and if necessary do some partnership working with them. Um, there was also some um, objections about the allocation of funding and how it should be spent to improve parking on St Ronan's Road instead of a zebra crossing and the response to that was that obviously it's two separate completely separate budgets and this had come out of the safer routes to school budget um, and then there were some other suggestions as well about um, stopping illegal parking around Albert Road um, and increasing the accessibility to shopping the shops along Albert Road to increase obviously uh, community accessibility and again we have responded to those residents saying that we will take into account everything that they've said but within the, safe, the remit of the Safer Routes to School budget, we can't actually address that. Um, so that's a summary of the objections that were raised, and um, we're confident that we've answered those points as, mu as fully as we can, so we would like to seek approval to continue with the scheme. Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Stubbs. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, mean, I think this um, scheme really is an, is an inevitable consequence of the expansion of the school and ever since the decision was taken to make the school larger that it's been necessary to have some form of crossing here and I would also fully accept that you, there's no point in building a pedestrian crossing except where pedestrians want to cross. That if you stick a pedestrian crossing somewhere up the road and say to people use that, well they won't, they'll just cross there anyway. So on the, on the general principle um, I'm supportive of the proposal that you have in front of you. Um, I do have a couple of um, questions and comments really uh, which we share well, on some of the details on this. So one is about how this connects into the um, eastbound cycle lane that there is on Albert Road now. Um, I mean that, that cycle lane I always think is um, a strong candidate for being um, the worst cycle lane in the city because it's extremely misleading because you can't have two vehicles passing each other along Albert Road without one of them driving in the cycle lane. So it gives a a false sense of security. Um, now I can't quite make out from this diagram how um, this scheme relates into that, um, and I'd like a bit of clarity on that if possible. Um, another angle on this is to do with, this, um, if you look on Appendix 1 on the diagram there, you see that there's a hatched area marked to the um, southeast um, on, on the junction there, and that's roughly outside of the school. Now, outside of the school, you also have, um, as part of fairly recent changes, a marked bay for minibuses, and you also have um, a cycle parking facility, which looks a bit like a car, and you can attach, um, you can attach cycles to it. And so, my um, question, stroke, comment is: Is there any way that that? space rather than just being a hatched area could be at least partially used for one of those purposes and they, the average space is just reconfigured just to make a marginal, you know, one space at the most um, increase in available parking. I mean on the face of it um, having cycle parking right next to the pedestrian crossing is not a bad idea uh, because that means if cyclists are going the other way then the first point is they can cross the road there at the pedestrian crossing rather than away from it um, in order to turn into the road. So I did wonder if there might be some scope um, for better use of that space. Um, and then the final thing really is about the the visibility um, of this junction. Now there's a little bit in the report, it touches on that somewhat in the EIA, but uh, I wasn't really um, clear uh, about specifically what it means. So there's mention of advanced signage and so on, and that's good. Um, what I've got in the back of my mind is the pedestrian crossing um, nearer to Kimberley Road over Highland Road, and I've had a number of complaints, and I, I think that they're fair, which is that it's difficult to see when you're driving along Highland Road. It's not immediately obvious that it's there. Um, and, you know, what is the situation on this? How how obvious is it just going to be signage? Are we going, is there going to be um, beacons there? I mean, how obvious is it going to be, particularly since it's on um, a junction? So that's it. That's my final question. So a couple of questions really about the cycle lane, the visibility, and then um, about whether it might be possible to reconfigure that hatched area to marginally increase parking. Um, but with those um, points aside, I think the fundamentals of the scheme are sound. Thank you, Councillor Stubbs. Michelle, can you answer some of those questions? Please. Um, yeah, I can. 
Well, the first thing I can do is look at the drawing. So the drawings were drawn up for, but they aren't the final drawings. So we can review the drawings and take into account the points, because obviously I can review it on the transcript, take into account the points that you've made. Um, uh, with, the, with the cycle lanes, obviously um, we don't have the road width to have statutory cycle lanes. So it is a, it's a guidance cycle lane, but the guidance cycle lanes still obviously raise awareness to drivers that cyclists are going to be there and within that area um, so and they hopefully more like so if you're planning to have a cycle lane through that junction I couldn't I wasn't clear from for, through the crossing I wasn't clear looking at the picture no it wouldn't go through it so if there's if there's a cycle lane either side of the proposed location of it then it's likely that it will um, continue either side of it but obviously a, a zebra crossing is for uh, pedestrians to have right of way and therefore vehicles including cyclists that are on the road would have to pull up and stop so we would expect them to do that if the if the location of the zebra crossing goes right through the cycle lane then that cycle lane will stop temporarily because it, it would do. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you said this is not the final plans. Can the final plans come come back before work starts? Well, if the scheme is approved, then we will send the final do diagrams up to ward councillors and to yourself for consultation. So, Is that okay with you, Councillor Stubbs? Thank you. Um, Councillor Bosher. Totally supportive of it, Councillor Stagg. Um, it actually started when I was a cabinet member well before March 2018 because the school ran a, a campaign where they were targeting bad parking on the, I think it's the St. Ronan's, St. Ronan's Road that comes down the side and, and other issues. And I went to meet their, their school council two or three times. Sitting on infant school sized chairs is not the greatest, but never mind. I think we've all been there as members. Um, and I have to say, the school council that I met were extremely eloquent in their demands. Perhaps a little bit more radical, cars are parked on double yellow lines, uh, £5,000 fine and have their car crushed was one suggestion that came out <laughs> of, a, of an infant school child. So, braver politician than I, I have to say on that. that but, Um, and, and there were similar ones, but the, the, the crossing point, particularly for those on, on the northern side of, of the Albert Road, was, was the one thing that came out loud and clear. It, it's, it's perhaps a shame it's taken so long to actually get here, but we are finally here, and um, I think, even though we're all politicians and it's gone through two different political colours, I think the driving force behind this are actually the school children and they should really be commended for actually getting what they want to make their lives safer and, and, and going to school. Thank you, Councillor Bush. Councillor Heaney. I don't have anything to add. It's, I'm happy to support this. Yeah, no problem. I, I have to say that I was a bit amused when I read, and not really, not funny, ha ha. Um, uh, resources should instead be spent on providing more resident parking along St. Ronan's Road at the expense of children's safety. I just wonder where people's values are, you know? That's just my personal comment. Um, right, so I'm, I'm happy to approve for this to go ahead and um, you will get the final um, plans back yep. to As soon um, as the final plans are complete, councillors. they will be sent out to yourself, opposition councillors and ward councillors. And Councillor Stubbs, I know this is not to do with it, I mentioned um, zebra crossing down near Kimberley Road. Can that be sort of looked into? I know there's probably no money around, but at least yes. we can. We can definitely look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. Um, agenda item seven, air quality local plan. Um, um, Felicity isn't, oh, oh, you were going to do it anyway, were you, or was Felicity going to do it? Felicity was going to do it on Friday. Right, okay, so um, Hayley will give us this. Thanks, Councillor Stagg. Um, the purpose of this information only report is to provide an update for noting on the development of Portsmouth's air quality local plan, um, and the, the purpose of the plan itself is to reduce levels of nitrogen dioxide pollution in the city. Um, you'll be aware that significant work has been undertaken as outlined in this paper. 
Um, the next milestone for us in the development of the Air Quality Local Plan is the submission of the outline business case to central government on the 31st of October this year. This will include the Council's preferred package of me measures to, in, to improve air quality in the <coughs> city based on the evidence that's currently being gathered. Thank you. Has anybody got any comments on Councillor Heaney? Well, as a newly elected member, I've been getting to grips with the issues around air quality because although I was obviously broadly aware of it, I wasn't quite aware of some of the detail that's been going on and it's been very interesting. Um, but it does pose some really some difficult challenges for us because um, it seems to me that the government's default position is that you will have a charging zone and we have to provide evidence that measures that we undertake will do as well as a charging zone in terms of changing behaviour or whatever. So um, obviously the consultation is still going on and I'm still learning stuff about this but I think we need to avoid a charging zone for all sorts of reasons. I think there are issues of equity and you know this seems to me uh, not the best way to persuade people to change their uh, habits. We, we have to have incentives that are carrots as well as sticks and we really need more carrots at the moment to try and encourage people to change their ways which includes a whole range of things which I won't go into, into now. Um, so I'll obviously be looking forward to uh, finding out more of this as we go on and, and hopefully uh, maybe having some influence on shaping what we actually do. Thank you. Um, Hayley, can you, can you um, just outline a few of the, the, the causes? I mean, for example, the, the worst offending vehicles, um, etc. So you might be aware that earlier this year we undertook what's called an automatic number plate recognition camera survey um, and that had lots of cameras around the city. Um, it recorded continuously 24 hours a day for seven days a week. We picked up 8 million vehicle movements in that time, so it's huge. So um, that survey has told us more about the local vehicle fleet in the city and the origins and destinations of journeys. So we now know more about what's causing the problem. Um, for us, unfortunately, the biggest problem is diesel cars. Um, and how do we solve that problem? And we also know that there's a the problem is not just caused by cars coming off of the island onto the island. It's also caused by trips that start and finish on the island. So local trips. Um, so that doesn't make it that easy to solve because of that mixture of, of origins and destinations. Um, we're also currently conducting some more research in the survey that you mentioned. Um, that is helping us to understand what local people's likely behavioural response would be if we were told by government that we have to have a charging clean air zone. Obviously we haven't got, we've never had one in the city so we don't know how people would respond. So that survey will give us a bit more information about that um, and help us to understand some of the economic impacts that you mentioned councillor. Um, and we've asked people for any ideas that they've got for mitigation measures because within the plan that we're submitting to government we need to come up with what's called a mitigation package so come up with ideas to help local people if we if um, a charging clean air zone were imposed on the city what can we do to to help them to manage that cost thank you Hayley um, and just a, a few points I'd, I'd like to make and that is that we are very um, aware of the impact that charging could have on low-income families and the fact that people might not be able to get around to the, do their jobs, etc. So um, we've written to Michael Gove to ask if there could be um, a scrappage um, policy uh, for low-income families and got to take a standard um, uh, reproduced uh, uh, letter back which didn't say anything really. So um, um, I think it's, it's going to need a hard push um, to get something coming from... Um, uh, central government, but I, I think the, the thing as well that we need to take into into account here on the island, because we are an island, is to have the increase in the number of um, vehicles in, in the island. Um, according to statistics, in 2007, there were 107,000 thereabouts um, cars registered to um, Portsmouth. Uh, at the end of last year, there were 120. 28,600, which is an increase of um, whatever it is, 20, uh, 21, 22,000, with no increase in, in parking spaces and no increase in, in the roads. So that's led to the congestion. Plus, the number of vans in that time has nearly doubled. Um, so 
um, that the, their contributory factors, and those are things we have to address. And I don't know exactly. It, it, it's educating people about um, anti-idling, for example. I mean, it's only a bit, but it, it's a, uh, um, quite big. But there were three people yesterday, because I, I live next door to a school, waiting for their children. Cars were, were idling. And they just went up and asked, could they turn their engines off, because we, we have an anti-idling policy. And they said, apologise, and, and, and they shut them off. So I think once people are aware of things, a lot of people will actually um, come around to, to realising the problems. So, um, but it, it's, it's a huge issue. But thank you for that, Hayley. Um, it's just to be noted, I think, isn't it? Um, right, and I think the next one is also you, is it? Oh, sorry. Oh, so I'm, I'm, do apologise. I was thinking that a bit earlier on, and then I sort of got distracted by my own thoughts. So apologies, Councillor. Well, I know Council's accustomed to me not saying very much, but I thought I might say something on this topic. Don't you look at me like that, Pam. <clears throat> we haven't got to that report yet. <laughs> I, I just have a few questions, um, but I'll start with the obvious ones to me. This is a, a for information report that's come to the Cabinet Member for Traffic and Transportation. And yet we've got a cross-party working group on air quality that feeds into the Cabinet as well. So why has this report come here then? Or are we duplicating efforts somewhere along the line? Um, no, we're not duplicating efforts. Um, there, there's a wide range of work that's being um, undertaken at the moment. And, it, and as you rightly point out, it, it does cross um, a number of portfolios. And this, the work that we're doing in terms of air quality does feed into the, the climate change um, wider um, work that's being undertaken by the council but we felt it was important to to take this report for noting to councillor Stagg because obviously this is going to have a, a, a significant impact on traffic and transportation portfolio going forward and we felt it was important to, to have that baseline just to capture where we where, where we are up to in terms of air quality so um, it's more of an awareness raising and compilation of information coming into one location that we thought might be helpful. You mentioned, <coughs> sorry, um, Lynn. Just good to say that, that it, this will go out, that the inf overall information will go out to all councillors. Um, the point I was making, I mean, Pam sort of touched on it, that there are other areas, i.e. other portfolio areas that are also involved in this. Do I deduce, because this, this is entirely traffic and transport centric, there's no talk about the port or industry or um, um, heating systems or, or anything else like that that are all going to have a significant impact, albeit not as much as, uh, as traffic and transportation I, I accept. So are there similar reports about other chunks of air quality going to other portfolios? Um, this report is predominantly based on the air quality local plan yeah. development. Um, the air quality local plan has, is a legal requirement on PCC and necessarily has a traffic and transportation focus because of the timescales involved. As you'll be aware, um, around 50% of emissions and 50% of the problem, if you like, is attributable to vehicular traffic. Mm -hmm. It's a lever that we can pull quite quickly, or at least the government believe that we can pull, pull that lever quite quickly in order to implement the scale of change that we need to in order to achieve compliance. So there, there's a vast um, array of work that is going on which, which covers the areas that you're talking about. But this in particular, because it, it's related specifically to the air quality local plan, and that is looking specifically at traffic and transportation as a way in which we can achieve, um, achieve compliance. That's why it's focused in that way. Okay, sorry, Lynn. Um, so I, I, I'm perhaps just concerned. I'm just probably just looking for some comfort as much as anything else. But if lots of bits of work are being done across lots of portfolios, that there's actually going to be something that knots this all together at the top. Now, is that going to be this cross-party working group that's going to tie all this lot together? Because having been around for quite a while, I've, I've seen how silos don't work in the past. And I'd hate to think on an issue as big as this, 
we're going to have different departments duplicating effort and nobody actually talking to each other going forward. No, I completely can understand your concern and can give you that reassurance that we are working in a cro cross portfolio um, way on the specific issue of air quality. We have a board on which, which is chaired by um, the Director of Public Health, which cuts across all the different um, directorates within the council who have a direct um, contribution to make. So we do have regeneration, the ports, planning, property, um, housing, those types of body, uh, directors to enable exactly the point you're making that we are looking at across rather than just in, in a siloed fashion. As I say, this report is specifically looking at the local plan, which is predominantly based around traffic and transportation, largely due to the time scales that we're dealing with. Okay, I've got one more, Lynn, if I can. Sorry about that. You did a seven-day monitor around the city. When, I, when, I, when I, I take it when you say around the city, you mean on Port Sea Island? No, there were also cameras off the island as well, but the majority were Port Sea. Excellent. Um, because I know Lynn wound me up when she made the city as an island comment, but, you know, because it's not, because about 25% of the island, of, of Portsmouth taxpayers actually live off the island. Now, just going forward, what are you looking at mitigating when it comes to those residents that live off the island that, that admittedly will live in perhaps a cleaner air area because of the density of it? But there is going to be an impact on that area of Portsmouth when, as and when we start tackling this. And I don't think anybody wants to go down the, the route of a, of a clean air zone. I mean, call it a congestion charge if you like. I think that's what everybody understands. Because that's going to have a material impact on, say, almost 25% of the residents that actually live off the island in the fact that they are likely to become encumbered with the... Um, problems created by people reducing what they're doing on Portsea Island and reflecting out. So what sort of work is being done to look at mitigation side of off the island? Um, yes, yeah, so that's part of the evidence base that we're gathering at the moment and the survey that's just gone out will help us really to understand that kind of thing. Um, so in a way we're fairly lucky as far as we can be in this process we're what's called a third wave authority so there's wave one and two authorities that have already gone through this process such as big cities like leeds birmingham even um, our neighbor southampton so we can learn a lot from what they've done um, and some of the measures that they've considered in terms of mitigation are things like scrappage schemes, mobility credit schemes, where people are given um, funds to spend on public transport, car clubs, that sort of thing. Um, and we could also look at if a government do impose a clean air zone on us, something like um, an exemption period for local residents, both on and off island, um, so they've got time to think about replacing their vehicle and things to avoid the charge. Um, so yeah, all those kind of things are in the mix and we're very much looking at them and we've got consultants working on kind of detailed economic analysis and stuff at the moment. So yes, yeah, a big piece of work and something we're, we're giving a lot of thought to. When are, we likely to see? when are we likely to see that report? Um, so we need to report to the final report to government's 31st of October. So yeah, by August we should have things ready because it does need to come to cabinet for sign off as well. So can I just add a few things, and, and that is that we are working, as, as Haley has said, um, the, the Environment Department, because um, it can't, the Environment Department is is sort of doing all the monitoring as far as um, what the, the air zones, the, clean, the pollution levels are, etc. But the causes, main causes are, as Haley said, mainly transport, but also buildings. And this is where the problem comes with the, the time that we got to get these plans in because one of the, the contributing contributory factors in buildings is um, gas central heating but you can't just go and rip out all the gas central heating throughout the city you know um, new buildings going up should be compliant and maybe not have um, gas central heating and have a different form of heating in, in them those are things to be considered a bit further down the line so although um, planning are aware of this they can't do anything about it immediately within the time scale that we've got which is two years um, and that's, that's about it so by the time all the, the um, 
plans are drawn up, it's going to be, well, as, as Harry said, by the end of October. So n nothing can start happening, really. We, well, obviously, we're doing some things like trying to get clean air zones and, and so forth. But the cross-party group is, is environment, um, transport, and public health at this moment in time. But planning, hopefully, will come into it um, at a later date. It's complex. It's not easy. There's no one uh, simple answer. I think I've covered most things there, haven't I? Um, I think my original point, Lynn, was the fact that I understand it's a complex argument and there are a lot of facets that apply to this. I mean, part of what I do is refrigeration, air conditioning and, and the like, so I know exactly what the technologies are and aren't that can actually support that. I understand it's complex. My, orig my original concern, it was a simple question, was that this is transport-centric report for noting and I didn't want the bureaucracy to be unnecessarily complex on a particularly complex issue, otherwise we could find ourselves in an almighty mess in 18 months time. That was where I was starting from, which is why I asked about why this report is here in the first place. Thank you. Um, Graham? No? Did I ask you before? I can't remember. I did. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Right. Um, thank you, um, um, Hayley, um, for noting. Right. And now the next one is item number eight, which is transport of the South East, formal consultation draft proposal to government. And is that you, Pam, or is it Haley's Pam? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report responds to the consultation on the draft proposal to government for the establishment of Transport for the South East as a sub-national transport board. Portsmouth City Council has been working with around 15 other authorities, as listed in 3.2, for the purpose of creating a long-term strategic plan to enable sustainable growth and improved productivity and to lever in funding from wider government agencies. The powers being sought are covered in section 6 of, of the paper in front of you and can only be enacted concurrently and with the consent of the local highway authority. You'll see that there's quite a wide range of powers being sought which reflects the broad um, membership of TFSC but as I say the powers can only be enacted alongside the local highway authority so concurrently with and with the consent of the highway authority. As such, it is recommended that the portfolio holder welcomes the draft proposal to establish a subnational transport body for the South East and approves the attached consultation response for submission to TFSE. Thank you, Pam. Councillor Bosher. <coughs> Did I give the game away? How much does it cost to be a member of this club, Pam? £30,000 annually. Is this the same? little arrangements that I was trotting off to Gatwick to meet with, um, with <coughs> Alan, it is, with Alan Cuffley, where we sat there listening to Kent saying how wonderful it was to have transport links going from Dover and Folkestone up into central London um, for £30,000 a year. It seemed to be all centred in, uh, in the east of the area. We call me a cynic, and I think we need to be a part of this, but in my experience, um, the, the sort of like the, the Hampshire area and West Sussex were very much being um, bypassed, shall we say, because I think we identified that really the transport links across the south tend to go up to London and back down again, and there's nothing much that actually goes east west across the south. But I do notice from the list that transport for London don't appear to be in this, so. Clearly, the powers that be that have put this together have succeeded in that one because they were proposed to be part of the original arrangement. But I, I, I guess I come back to the original point that um, as much as it was fascinating, I always found that it was going to be 12 hours of my life I wasn't going to get back. And for £30,000, I'm sure that Councillor Stagg will feel exactly the same way. But I guess we've got to be a part of this club if we're going to try and get something for the South, uh, South Portsmouth area. I, I totally agree with you, Councillor Bosch. In fact, I think it's my second meeting. I, I thought I'd go to the first and see what's all going on. And I came away thinking, hang on, where, where are we in this? So the next meeting, I asked when the next stakeholders meeting was going to be held and where. And I was told it was Gatwick. So I said, well, what about 
um, Portsmouth and Southampton. And I was looked at as if I was something from outer space. I mean, I know people look at me like that occasionally anyway. Um, but, you know, wh wh where's this woman come from? What are you talking about? She, and I, I, I think his words were, but that's in the extreme southwest. And I said, yes, it's in the southwest of the southeast. So where do we fit in? Um, because we need to have um, connectivity right across the whole region. And um, I think they're actually um, pay giving us more attention now, aren't they, Pam? Yes, I would agree. I think that um, TFSE in its, in its current shadow form has been quite vocal in terms of the importance of east-west links both through rail and, and road and are certainly supporting us in our work with South, uh, South Western Rail to improve connectivity specifically between Portsmouth and Southampton. We've also... It's a work in progress. We've also um, amended um, the structure that we have in terms of, of the votes. You'll remember that um, originally we were joint members with Southampton, um, which obviously meant that we had half a voice, if you like, and that has been changed now. So we have one vote for each Southampton and ourselves, and are collaborating quite closely still with, with Southampton, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight in order to ensure that the, the Solent perspective is, is very definitely heard at the TFSC meetings. Kasahini. Yes, I, I think um, you all share, we all share the same uh, concerns about this, that this is potentially quite useful, but we're not quite sure how useful it's going to be. I mean, clearly talking to each other is very well, but when I'm looking at the powers that it says here, I'm, I'm struggling to work out exactly what it will give us, really, in terms of what we can actually do. It talks about securing the provision of bus services, entry into quality bus partnership and bus franchising arrangement. Well, that sounds very good, but I'm not quite sure how much control we will actually be able to exercise maybe a cross authority on some of these issues because it seems to me that one of the things about transport it's not about local authority boundaries it's crossing boundaries people commute from this area to area and if we're going to tackle some transport problems we need to have powers to do things across borders and when uh, Pam was saying that you know we the highways authorities have to agree well the highways authorities are going to be in large part county councils so we have to get them to agree to do so we can't say actually this should be done and they can be overridden they've got to agree to it so we have another potential uh, barrier if there's not proper proper cooperation there and we're also being talked about here we, we, we are able to joint, jointly setting the road investment strategy for the TFSE I'm not quite sure what that means whether we get a chance to have our say about what we want and then the government tells us what we're going to get or whether we really genuinely do have some influence over what the investment strategy is going to be because it, if we did it would be really good but I'm not quite clear um, whether whether we will um, again being consulted on rail franchising setting the overall objectives for the rail network in the TFSE now that sounds quite good if we are really able to dictate to the rail industry what we want this is what we want you to provide you are a service provider then it could be quite good but i'm still a bit unclear um on 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 this so any clarification on that would be quite quite useful but i share council Bosch's concern here we're paying a lot of money and are we just having a bit of a talking shop or are we having something that will really make a difference to what we can do so i, I would arguably say because my first sitting on this was in 2017 I think it would have been the autumn of 2017 and, and I think it's indicative that here we are and you're going to make a decision on spending £30,000 to be part of this that's effectively two and a half almost three years after it started and it's still a talking shop trying to work out what its parameters are and what it really really wants um, and, I, and I think that your, your successor or whoever probably in five years time is going to be doing exactly the same thing and the only thing that's going to change is the cost of membership which will unlikely go up. <laughs> Do you want me to try and... <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, in terms of how influential a subnational transport body can be, if you look at Transport for the North as a comparator, that has obviously been hugely... Um, significance in terms of the north of England, in terms of what it's it's been looking at, the 
the, the, the powers and the ability of, of the subnational transport board to be influential depends to a large degree on the appetite of the members in terms of how willing we as a collective of authorities are in terms of um, pushing forward an agenda. I think it's fair to say that the TFSC covers an area which um, wouldn't ordinarily sit together. It's quite difficult to unite um, as, as you said, there's a lot of shire counties, for example, and there's, uh, uh, it's not immediately obvious that it is a functional area in, in that sense. So that is something that we have struggled with, and it is something that, that we will, I would imagine, continue to, to wrangle with. But I suppose I would say that, that this is a, to make this partnership work, it takes an awful lot of time. The government has shown quite significant commitment to TFSE. 1.5 million has been um, allocated to TFSE so far in order to create a strategy to undertake the evidence-based um, review that's needed. TFSE, were it to be awarded um, statutory, statutory status, would end up having quite a significant role to play in terms of um, the allocation of funding through the uh, major road network. So it is a body that we probably do want to, to be involved in. Um, money will be allocated through it, so it's a game that we do want to play, I think. But um, I do note your concerns. Um, but I suppose it is early days as yet. I suppose, realistically, we have to give it a try and see what happens, and if it doesn't work, then we have to say, cut. <laughs> I think we're getting more traction, if that's the right word, because of um, um, the two city areas, Southampton and Portsmouth, shortlisted for Transforming Cities Fund, um, plus Solent Transport. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, we're actually having visibility, I think, um, and, and backing from, from there, and I think that makes us more important. And it, it depends how much we shout when we're, when we're there, and I'm quite prepared to um, shout the odds. I, I have to admit there are one or two um, things I'm concerned about. Um, one is establishing clean air zones with the power to charge high-polluting vehicles for using the highway. I mean, I'm not against that in principle, but I want, if we're going to do it, either it gets imposed on us or we make a decision not being decided on by um, uh, a body outside. That's my personal view. That's not necessarily the view of, of the um, establishment. Uh, and bus franchising is another questionable area um, because, again, um, we're, we're, the bus companies don't want that and we are relying on um, first and, and um, um, stagecoach. Um, to help back us up in, in the Transforming Cities Fund, aren't we? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. Um, but I think if we, if we can get ourselves established, and I think we're getting there slowly, um, but watch this space. It might all go pear-shaped, I don't know. Yeah, fair enough, um, I mean, because I think this is something, I mean, it affects the whole city, so and it should be completely um, cross-party as far as that's concerned. Um, but I, I am reasonably happy to, to okay it. <laughs> I do have concerns, I must um, say. Um, what's our next one? Was that um, item number nine? Um, oh, that's you, Pam. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the purpose of this report is to provide an update on the success of the Portsmouth City Council's tranche one bid to the Department of, uh, for Transport's Transforming Cities Fund and on the submission of the draft strategic outline business case for tranche two in partnership with Hampshire County Council and the Isle of Wight. Um, Portsmouth City Council jointly with Hampshire and the Isle of Wight were successful in being shortlisted as part of the Transforming Cities Fund bid. Um, we have been in a period of co-development with the DFT since then in order to put forward a bid for what is a very sizable pot of funding, around 1.28 billion is on offer currently. Um, we submitted a number of short uh, quick wins which are listed out on, in section 3.4. Um, we were awarded the full four million pounds that we asked for in order to commence construction on those um, sites and the installation of uh, real-time passenger information. 
and we are now busy working on our strategic, uh, the final version of our business case for submission in November. It should be noted also that following the publication of this report, we were successful along with our colleagues through Solent Transport um, as one of six bids to have shortlisted um, in the short, uh, Future Mobility Zone Fund and we are proceeding in a period of co-development with the DFT for that fund also. This bid, the Future Mobility Fund bid will support the work that's being undertaken in both um, Southampton and Portsmouth through the Transforming Cities Fund. As such, the recommendations of the paper are that the success and progress of the tranche one um, aspect of the Transforming Cities Fund bid is noted, and that the proposed candidate infrastructure schemes outlined in section 3.14 are endorsed and are developed further, considera further for consideration within the strategic outline case for tranche two. Thank you, Pam. And I think um, we're trying to get um, a whole council briefing on this, aren't we? Um, which I asked for, so because I think it'll affect most wards in, in the city. Um, so I, I think they're having difficulty in finding a room big enough to um, accommodate all 42 um, councillors. That's the date we're looking yeah, at, actually, for the next one. Graham, Just to ask a question about the, um, it says the candidate schemes for regeneration in tranche two. Presumably, this will be whittled down to a smaller number at some point. Is that is that my is that a correct understanding? That's what I assume. Or are we uh, hoping to, to get all of them? We're hoping to get all of them. Um, the DFT have asked that we pr produce a high, medium, low um, set of scenarios for funding. So we are we're going big. We're being very ambitious um, in terms of what we would like to bid for, and then we'll, we'll follow that up with the medium and, and low package, um, which we will determine in conjunction with our colleagues and also with the DFT, um, with whom we're working in partnership. So we're making all these ones high priority, hoping to get all of them. The proposals that we've put together um, are essentially the culmination of around a decade's worth of work that um, ourselves, along with Hampshire in particular, have been working on. Um, I think th there is increasing recognition of the fact that we need to do things differently, with the air quality um, position in Portsmouth being as it is, the growth agenda, the levels of congestion, um, incidents of, of road traffic collisions being as they are, there is a need that we really consider how we want people to move around in the future and how we want people to be able to access jobs, retail, leisure facilities. And this provides a truly transformational opportunity for the city region to, to do that. So yes, in an ideal world we would get all of it. Um, it's a very strong bid, I feel. Um, we have very good support, as Councillor Stagg mentioned, from our public transport operate, operators for this, and it offers significant benefit for our residents. Um, we do, however, have to be realistic also, in the sense that there are many, um, many officers sitting in front of their portfolio holders and, and, and opposition spokespeople saying very similar things to me. <laughs> so we do need to provide a medium and a low option, and, and we're working through that. But as I say, we, we, we are very enthusiastic about this bid. I think one of the things as well is that they're all almost in, interdependent, aren't they? Um, because if you can have free flow of traffic, you, you've got to have all the, the, the points joined up. Um, Councillor Bersher. Really? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Pam. I will say something. <laughs> Again, um, the, the first one with the £4 million started under my watch, but I'm not going to claim it politically. What I would do is say a big shout to all the officers because we've got a great team in traffic and transportation and to get some of the funding from some of the places they do is astounding for some of the stuff that we've actually been, around, been able to do around the city. So I'd just like to make that comment that some of the officers we have are top quality when it comes to that sort of stuff. 
And when you consider that um, the number of officers has, has decreased, you know, with, with cuts left, right, and centre, so people are working beyond um, their no, no, I'm, beyond the time that is sort of put out for them. So uh, I know lots of people work in, uh, in their, their own time, don't they, Nikki? Um, different matter. But thank you very much. Right, now this is probably going to be the, the controversial one, yes? Um, agenda item number 10. So is it Nikki or Kevin? Go on, Kevin, thank you. Council Norton's asked oh, yes. to speak on this. Apologies, one. Council Norton, would you like to come and join us? Okay, so I'm going to speak briefly on this. Uh, no, um, me no, to go. Um, Kevin, Kevin will introduce it and then, then I'll ask you to speak. Okay. Over to Kevin. I realise you're very eager. But very eager. Hot, that's what it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the purpose of this report is to uh, propose a number of improvements to the residence parking scheme uh, that have come out of recent consultations um, and to um, tidy up a, an anomaly with the scheme. The first, the first proposal is to um, exclude student halls of residence from eligibility for uh, residence parking permits. Uh, this comes about uh, due to the way in which addresses have been allocated in the past. Um, when initial schemes went in, student halls were classed as one property. Um, the way the modern societies developed, students need to take out contracts and need a postal address. So each student room is classified as a postal address, which makes every room eligible for for a uh, for a permit. Um, there are only a few students currently living in halls that have permits. Last time I looked, it was around 17. Um, so it's it's really a tidying up exercise um, to um, remove remove an anomaly. Um, the second recommendation is uh, to change the procedure for issuing permits so that people who live in different parts of the city, different uh, controlled parking zones, can share a car. We've had a number of requests from um, people currently uh, to get a permit. Your car needs to be registered to the address uh, at which you live, and obviously a car can only be registered to one address, so if you're sharing a car, and it's shared between two people living in different zones, it's, it's quite difficult. So the way to overcome that is to change the criteria and ask to see the insurance documents which should confirm um, the status of um, both the drivers on, on, on the insurance. Um, the third proposal um, is to introduce a reduced charge for permits for electric vehicles, free permits for electric vehicles for households who only have one car and it's solely powered by electricity, um, and to reduce the charge for vehicles that emit um, 100 grams of CO2 or less per kilometre. Um, again, households that only have one car with that, um, that meet that criteria, it's recommended that their permit charge is reduced to £15. In paragraph 310, I've recommended that we exclude all diesel cars because as we heard earlier diesel cars um, have other issues in terms of the particulate emissions that they they have. Um, the CO2 threshold of 100 kilograms is what used to be used uh, for tax banding purposes. It's used by many councils. Um, to operate it successfully you need something that residents can easily check and that councils can easily check and the CO2 emissions are readily available online. So it's a, 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 a realistic way of introducing uh, a benefit for people who have lower emitting cars. Uh, the fourth recommendation is to reduce the cost of third permits uh, from £590 down to £300. Third permits are only issued in parking zones where there is space for those cars. Um, Currently, the, there's um, reports that people with three cars are not paying the permit charge but parking them in other areas, so it's actually causing displacement. Um, so by reducing the charge, uh, it's still quite a high uh, deterrent to people having a third car, but it's hoped that, that you know, they, there won't be so much displacement. Um, the report also um, highlights two other issues. 
Um, there's been a lot of talk about overlapping boundaries or fuzzy boundaries, and the report describes a way of introducing those to ease problems around boundaries, because currently you can uh, have a permit and only park on one side of the boundary. Uh, by designating the bays on either side of the boundary for either permit holder, you can have a sort of overlapping area or, or, or a fuzzy boundary. Uh, and finally, the report talks about um, the situation in a number of zones where um, there are far more permits than there are spaces, um, and possibly in future zones as well. And suggests that w we will be looking at ways of, a fair ways of uh, limiting the number of permits that are issued. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Councillor Norton. Thank you. Uh, I'm only going to speak briefly and off the cuff on this mainly, but it will come as no surprise that once again um, I'm objecting to uh, what I see as another piecemeal parking zone across um, this city. And the reason for that is uh, with this one, it hurts business. This is going to be a system which is going to make it very difficult for lots of the traders along uh, around that area to function, especially in a time when we should be doing more to save our, our, our high streets and protect them. Um, the times of the these zones are, are going to do the opposite. It's going to have a detrimental effect, I think. Um, for instance, if you are somebody who wants to use the local vet that's there, I think uh, people are going to take their poorly cats and, and not be able to park and potentially you know, have to walk miles to get to their vet. What will they do? Then they'll go and use a vet somewhere else where they can park, making it very difficult for um, that area uh, to thrive from a business perspective. Um, on top of that, I think it's, it's about the communications that we have with residents. Now, if I'm a resident uh, in this city, I would not know whether I'm coming or going when it comes to parking zones because I'm being told constantly uh, various things year in, year out, and the goalposts uh, continually change. Uh, one, to, uh, one year I'm being told that, you know, if I want a resident parking zone, I can have it. The next I'm being told that you need 70% of your residents in your street to sign up to it, and then a 50%. Then it, we get figures that are uh, completely out of nowhere, and I think we have a duty to residents across this city to be more transparent with them in terms of how we're um, putting these zones in and, and the consul levels of consultation that we have. Um, it, it doesn't help when we get uh, Councillor Stagg's colleagues putting comments out there such as, you know, we've had overwhelming support for this, when, you know, if you ask three people and two of them say yes, then you could say that's overwhelming support. But I do think we need to be a little bit more transparent with, with those figures and, and the responses and, and, and how we handle them. Now, this is not just me as an opposition councillor uh, responding to this. I think it's uh, evidently clear that there are people um, within the administration, or, well, after today, um, uh, at least one member who's not within the administration anymore who feels exactly the same. And to quote the former uh, cabinet member for uh, resources on uh, today in the news on residence parking, they didn't listen to residents. Now that's you know, for want of a better word, straight from the horse's mouth. So it's it's very difficult, I think, for us to um, to really, really uh, agree to these kind of things and say that residents are uh, fully informed and and we're taking their opinions on board when it when it's constantly changing. Um, I said I'd keep this brief, and I will. Um, yes, residents in in these areas, uh, on this area, want a resident parking zone, but they've objected to a resident parking zone within these times. The 4:30 to 6:30 means that business owners are going to potentially have to pay for permits for their employees, um, and the whole situation yet again has been handled dreadfully. It's, uh, you've heard me say this before, it's neither liberal nor democratic, and how can we put a zone in with less than 20% return? Thank you. Um, I'm, can I just make a few points? Um, but the uh, cat clinic, we have made provision, um, or Kevin is making provision, for um, the uh, limited time parking on Albert Road to be extended, the hours extended. Am I right in saying that, Kevin? Yes. Sir. Yes. Um, and can I quote, I mean, two vets I happen to know. Vets are pets on the... Uh, oh. Nikki was sorry, Nikki. No, sorry, I didn't have a different view. I just didn't realise we were discussing a particular parking zone. And I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> talking about, because no, I was to refer to which zone he was talking about, so I don't know... 
Um, MD. MD, yeah, yes, okay. Um, um, so, can I quote, Pettifet and Milton Road, they haven't got parking um, uh, specially um, set aside, um, and no, no, um, uh, well, no, no special parking. Grove Vets, which I use now, and Grove has, has none, and often I have to go around and, and find some, but I always find some in the end. Um, uh, the percentage majority, that has not changed dramatically. I, when I was cabinet member back in 2008-2009, thought that we needed to get 51% of people responding. We tried that with Councillor Ken Elkham, who was then parking manager, and it just didn't work. We tried several, and the, the, the response, people, it's, people are busy now, so, so, it, so it's not moved around, so it's gone back to um, as it was before I took over in the first place, and that is a majority. And let, how and much I'm, that's... Let, me, let me just finish, please. Um, and can I just say about the, um, the MD, the... the, the Councillor um, uh, uh, Smith, uh, Jeanette Smith, um, her, her objection was the timing, and which we said okay. we will review. And we said that way before um, any comments were made by anybody else. And, and it was essentially for residents, and it was a very simple time to be able, because it fitted in with MB, MC, um, for, for, from the point of view of enforcement, it's pointless having the residence parking zone if you haven't got the, re the CEOs to enforce it. Otherwise, um, people will just, you know, be fed up. They're paying for a residence um, a permit and they're not getting one. So I just wanted to clarify yeah, those points. So on that, so how many residents have said that they are happy for a resident parking um, zone to go in um, ar around those times in MD? Um, I, um, um, the, the MD report was taken a week ago, and that decision has been made. I'm sorry, I don't have the report. Um, I don't have the report. Okay. Yes, it was a week last Monday, and right. it was taken by cabinet. Okay. Right. Um, Councillor, which one? Uh, Councillor Heen, I think, is next. I'm trying to alternate you, so I don't leave anybody out. All right. Okay. Well, well, I don't know whether Councillor Norton was expecting the MD zone to come to this um, cabinet meeting, um, because I think a lot of us were. Um, but it didn't. It went to the full cabinet, and because I was able to attend, rearranging my work commitments to do so, and did actually make a very strong point about the fact that the decision had been moved at such short notice, um, and had inconvenienced quite a number of people, including me, uh, but particularly, more particularly, residents who had hoped to come along and have a say, and ended up not being able to because they were not able to come along at ten o'clock on a Monday morning when they could probably have come along at four o'clock on a, or yeah, twenty past five on a. On a, on, a, on a Thursday afternoon. So, um, yeah, I had expected to be able to deal with it here, and obviously uh, it, it's, it's certainly something that I do hope will not happen again. I think the point's been, been, been clearly made. Um, in relation to the report that we've got in, in front of us, I mean, there are some changes which I think I quite understand on student halls residents. I understand why you'd want to make those changes. Um, I understand why you'd want to encourage people to have low emission vehicles and, and, and uh, give them uh, some benefit as a, re as a result of that. I think the one thing I'm, I'm a little uh, puzzled about is, is the third permit price one. Because basically the, the argument, I can see an argument that's saying if you have a zone which is only two hours, then I can understand that somebody might not have not buy a third permit because it's cheaper to buy a visitor permit. But is it therefore proposed that this reduced cost for third permit charge will only apply in the two-hour zones, or will it occur across the board? That's one question. Come back to that in a minute. Um, what is the evidence that we have about um, displacement of third vehicles? Because I'm not quite sure how we know who's got third vehicles. <laughs> we know how many people apply for permits. There are apparently 32. Um, oh, sorry, 37. Um, but somebody who just didn't want to apply wouldn't apply so how do we know how many third vehicles there are in RPZs I, I'm not sure we know what the deplacement effect are, is on that um, so I'm, I'm curious about that and so I'm not quite sure what the the real benefit of reducing the charge will be except for the, 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 the two hour zones on the fuzzy, what we call, we'll call it the fuzzy boundaries I suppose it's easier. there were clearly some issues relating to the MD area, particularly in Campbell Road, that was when we didn't have a parking zone in one area and we did have one in another. Is it the proposal, the suggestion that fuzzy zones would apply in areas where there is a parking zone and the boundary has no parking zone, or is this an issue where people will be able to 
to choose which zone to park in if there are two adjacent parking zones because I'm a little unclear about that as well that's an, an, another question I wanted to um, um, to ask um, in terms of the, the, the limit on spaces when you talk about permit numbers and regions, I mean partly the 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 reason you end up with a situation of <coughs> less park oh, sorry not enough parking spaces and, and more people apply for them is the way you draw the boundaries I mean clearly the way you draw boundaries will to a sense provide the geographical limits of a scheme if you draw them in such a way that is quite tight you might end up with a situation where you do create a situation where there are more residents with cars than can possibly park in those streets so I think this goes back to the idea of how you design schemes I mean I I, I, I Nikki will probably uh, fed up the sight of me because I've been asking lots of questions about how parking systems to get my head around how this all works because it is quite complicated and, and I can see that there are some areas where there is um, a gap and I've obviously been able to see where those are but a lot of areas where there isn't so I, the, the issue about the permit number seems to me about how you draw the boundaries and I think any attempt to maybe artificially tell people when you create a parking scheme that well you've lived here for 20 years but now we've got a parking scheme and actually you can't have more than one car you've had more than two cars yeah when they may have had three cars for all sorts of reasons which I could I could I could give you so I, I have a, I have a number of questions really about the the proposals Kevin can you answer um, yeah, thank you. those as um, the expert <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, the proposal for the third permit goes across the board, so throughout all zones. Uh, in terms of the evidence for it, we have a lot of reports from uh, residents living outside zones that cars are being uh, um, displaced. Um, but yes, you're right, it's very difficult to tell exactly how many the cars there are. Um, Exactly. I mean, we, we, we have the issue where people say, oh, the cars parked they're all student cars. Well, how do they know they're student cars? There is often an assumption that it's certain types of people. So that's... Yeah, but they're, they're, it's, it's anecdotally reported to us. So, uh, in terms of the um, fuzzy boundaries, the proposal or the way it can be done with a TRO is you would have uh, a boundary that says this is area A, and another boundary that says this is area B and anybody living in area A would get an area A permit anybody living in area B would get an area B permit but what you can do on that boundary rather than being limited by that boundary if you've got an A and you're right on the boundary you can't park on the you can't currently park on in the bays directly across the road so by designating the bays either side of that boundary for A or B permits you could you overcome that problem so you would still have a fixed area for which would decide what permit letter designation you got um, but the, the bays on either side of the, the boundary would would be flexible for either permit holder does that, does that? and in terms of um, overcoming the number of vehicles by designing the, uh, uh, the zone or the size of the zone um, it in some cases that's limited because if you have too big a zone you get cross commuting across it so uh, and you can defeat the point of having a zone because you know, if you've got a, an attraction like a shop or, or, or a station and the zone is too wide then people will uh, will go across it so um, what we're what we're intending to do is look at fair ways of limiting um, permits within the the, the the zones, and if there are other ways of doing it, I'm sure we'll consider those as well. Any other questions, uh, Councillor Healy? Not really. I will look forward to seeing the fair ways of limiting parking permits. Councillor Bosher, I'm sure you're going to wax lyrical on this. I just looking at the clock actually, um, <laughs> Lena, I've got a meeting at seven, so plenty of time on this one. <laughs> First, I'd like to congratulate Kevin. Having spent my school years going on and being taught and thinking, what's the point of a Venn diagram? I've waited almost 40 years for somebody to come up with an example of one with fuzzy boundaries that comes close to a Venn diagram. So you got me before I retired on that one. Um, just touching on MD zone, because I couldn't make the meeting because it was 10 o'clock on a work day and it seems that the cabinet have decided they 
rather you didn't make the decision as the cabinet member and I think it's only happened once before and that was MB and MC I seem to recollect that the cabinet did a rush decision so clearly they don't trust their cabinet members but we're reviewing it in six months time so if I understand that right we've had an informal consultation come up with a TRO had a TRO consultation decided whether people wanted the times or not that that was what we were going to go with so we're going to spend out on the signage and everything else and put the TRO in and then in six months time we're going to do another informal consultation see whether people like it or not and if they don't we're going to go through another TRO we're going to go out for a formal consultation and then we're going to spend more money changing all the signage Can I just Nobody's say, disagreeing with no, me, they're all I, looking I blankly. Say, but <laughs> can I just say that we, the option, we could have actually um, not gone ahead with that, the TRO, um, but it would have had it. To change the time, we would have had to have had another TRO, so we'd have to go for another consultation, and that would have held up things for, I don't know how many months? You're quite, you're quite right, Lynn, but that's actually what, you, what you've just said, is what you're proposing to do in six months' time. But... Well, the, the idea was that let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, we will um, change it. It may well work. Because a lot of these, once you put them in, um, the who, who ha, um, dies down. It may not. Let's see. I don't know. I can't forecast. That's a cynic. That is me. Okay, I've, I've got several questions um, on this, and it's a case of where do I actually start? Let's start with student halls of residence. I, I, I guess the TRO that was uh, that was um, legal issue that delayed the tax parking report has been resolved now. Then has it, and so that they're not treated as individual units; they're treated as as one building from a TRO point of view. That's right. Yeah. Now you, you've sort of targeted the student halls of residence, where if you go to your director of finance um, comments. There are currently 17 passes issued to people living in student halls of residence. It's anticipated that the loss of income will be in the region of £510 per annum. So we seem to have targeted something on the perception when actually it's not necessarily the halls of residence we're talking about, it's the students that live in HMOs in residence parking zones that seem to be the issue that people get. So what are we actually doing with the university with regards to stopping all students rather than us actually tackling a few student halls of residence where actually there's only 17 passes actually being issued because clearly it's a university issue that rather than them pander to it, they should actually be doing something a little bit more robust to make sure that the perception, and it is a perception because depending on who you actually speak to, some say it's always students and others will say we don't have that many students with cars, but clearly the anecdotal evidence, which is what we've used quite, quite a lot as a phrase, says that it's actually students that don't live in halls of residence as such, but actually live out in the communities that are causing the issue because we can't tackle those and actually we can get they can get round it by registering their car at an address and ka ching they've got themselves a, a zone permit. Do, do either of you want to comment or, or Pam? Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly means anybody who lives in a zone who registers their car to that household is is entitled to apply for a residence parking permit. Um, as you'll have seen from the pricing structure um, that we are recommending in this report, it does increase quite significantly from a first permit, and that is a way of encouraging households to have fewer cars rather than more cars. But in, t in terms of the meeting the eligibility criteria, I, we're not proposing um, limiting that for certain sectors of the population but based on whether they're students or not in that sense well you sort of are limiting it because uh, it comes under the equality impact assessment says something slightly different but hey ho right going backwards can i just come in there and 
I believe this has all come back with the new blocks, um, the halls of residence, because if I mean, some of them have got 300, 400 um, students each, each, uh, Nikki. Yeah, I think the two are linked, actually. So at the minute, is, these are talking about existing residence parking zones and closing a loophole whereby we've got these big blocks that have been built that previously had one postal address. Now each room's got its own postal address. At the minute, under the criteria, we can issue a maximum of two resident permits per address. So potentially, each of those rooms is entitled to two permits. I, I know what you're saying, but that was addressed as part of the TRO last year, wasn't it? Yeah. No, sorry, it has to be advertised now that it's coming to uh, uh, this decision making to get agreement to go out to the TRO. Sorry, so the, 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 the phraseology of the TRO that was in place last year, which created problems because each student, let's say student unit, could apply for um, a residence parking zone which delayed the tax report into parking by six months because it had to be rewritten. That was the advice I was given as chairman. Is only now coming to this meeting now to actually have it resolved. This is the first meeting since we got agreement, legal uh, agreement on, on the writing of the TRO and we also had to, well, we also consulted with the university. So we have had, We've got everything in place, but we need a, a, a decision to go ahead and advertise it. I think we're entering into the rounds of a conversation for another day, um, in all honesty, because I'm, I'm going back to chairing that report. And I, have, I had good advice at the time, and this is going back to August and September of last year, that we could not sign off the residence parking report that went through the text panel until the TRO regarding student accommodation had been resolved. And we sat there until February or March time before we were told it's resolved and you could now sign it off. And we got it done and dusted at the 11th hour before PERDA when I had made commitments to people in the public that we wanted it signed off in September of the previous year, got made to look quite stupid because it then delayed six months. And now we're considering this TRO at this meeting now, which sort of begs the question, why was the advice I was being given last autumn not fitting up with what I was actually, with what we actually got before us now? The issue that delayed the text report was exactly, as you say, the fact that we had this loophole and we didn't know what to do about it, in the sense that it, it came to light at, at the the very last minute that what we had understood to be um, correct from the text perspective, text perspective, i.e. if you live in a student halls of residence you are ineligible for a permit, was not accurate at all in fact. And that was because of the change in the addresses. So it was that, it was understanding how we could get from that point, i.e. we've got a problem, what do we do about it, and getting the solution that was the issue which led to the delay because we couldn't sign off a report that didn't have a clear way forward on, on particularly that issue because obviously it raised issues around um, the potential for quite a significant increase in applications for permits from students if we didn't have a clear, a clear solution and also we needed to understand that the university was on board with what we were doing um, in terms of the approach we were then able to identify, i.e. going through the TRO route in order to limit the opportunities for those who are living in student blocks. So that was what the delay was associated with the text report. We actually inserted something, sorry uh, Lynn, we actually inserted, inserted something into the text report which off the top of my head and I haven't got the report and I would need to check, actually said it had been resolved which in theory if we're sitting here at this meeting about to sort of like go forward with the TRO on that, actually that's not quite true. I'll have to double check the wording because I don't remember myself either. Uh, I think we're moving into something that I need to 
look yes, at elsewhere. Uh, I have no knowledge of this at all. No, and I'm not. And, and with, with respect, Lynn, I'm, I'm not hanging it on you no, 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 in no, any no. shape or form. It's just. I just uh, want to make it clear. It's just come out of this. Under 3.4, the insurance document confirms that both the registered keeper and the share of the insurer are insured to drive the car, and the vehicle can be kept at either of the two addresses. Are we legally entitled to ask that for that information? Yes, I believe we, we are. are. Okay. I believe we can ask for any information that we want. It's up to the applicant whether they provide whether they want to provide it. Okay. Now I come back to the recommendations. So I'll sort of work backwards through the report. And they're about as fuzzy as the boundaries, if you actually look at it. Because the recommendations are what you're going to hang the the process uh, on at the end of the day. So what's contained in two is effectively what we're actually going to go through, not necessarily the bulk of the report. Now, when I first read this, and let's look at uh, 2.2 little 1. The charge for permits are changed to allow households with one vehicle powered solely by electrics, electricity to obtain, to obtain a permit free of charge. And, to, and it goes on to reduce the others. Well, let's take the electric one free of charge. I read that, that I could have two vehicles. One of them is an electric vehicle, one of them is something else. And then you could look at it and say, OK, do I have my first permit free and then have to pay 100 quid for a second permit for a second car? Or am I crafty and say, I'll have my other car for 30 quid and get my electric vehicle for free? Because that's the interpretation of the recommendations that you've actually got in this report. It's only when you go further into the report that it infers that it's only one vehicle. The same applies when you actually look at one vehicle which emits less than 100 grams of CO2, can have a £15 permit, and the same argument applies there. Do I have my vehicle with 101 grams as my first car at 30 quid, and I get my second one for £15, but actually, could it, should it be £15 for the first one and £100 for the second one? But actually, it doesn't mean any of that at all. It means one household is limited to one car that fits that criteria and no more when you look into the body of the report. But you've got to hang the recommendations on the policies that you actually put out. And those recommendations are ambiguous in what they actually say in the first instance. It also doesn't address the fact that if I own one electric car and I get my first permit for free, and then let's say six months down the road my partner decides to buy a car with 101 grams of CO2, are we as a local authority going to turn around and say, no, sorry, you can't have a second car, you're not allowed a second car, because that's what our recommendations say, or are we, are we turning around and saying, yes, you can have a second car, it's 100 quid, but you've got to pay, also got to pay £30 for a first permit, even though it's an electric car. There are so many ambiguities around these recommendations that it makes fuzzy boundaries seem clear and straightforward to me. And yes. I think you need to look very carefully at how these have been written. Because I think I've just explained, I've just interpreted some of those in four or five different ways and, they, uh, and from what I've actually read there, but actually when you go into the body of the report, all my interpretations actually aren't true because it's just limiting you to one car. Would it, if, you, if it was inserted, um, so charge of permits are, are, are changed to allow house, households with only one vehicle, which is powered solely by electricity, would that satisfy it or not? I'm not 100% certain. It's your decision. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on, on um, um, English grammar. Um, or can, can I just ask that we get some clarification from what he's meant? Because I think Simon's made a point about it. it's not. I thought I understood it when I read it, but maybe it's not. So we need to be clear. The recommendation says one thing, and the body of the report actually says something very slightly different. So could we have clarification Kevin. on what the recommendation the, the recommendation is that households with only one vehicle which is powered by electricity get a free permit and that households with only one vehicle which emits under 100 grams of CO2 per kilometre can get a permit for £15. If a, if a 
household has two vehicles, then that discount doesn't apply. It doesn't mean they can't get a second permit, it just means that discount doesn't apply. If they get a second permit part way through the year, then I would suggest they will have a problem at renewal. So, I'm sorry, Lynn, but on the one hand, you've got the head of parking here that's having to explain this and using words like, I would suggest that. This has got to go out and it's got to be as clear as day to residents when they are applying for permits, black and white, as to what they can and can't do. And, and what, you are, what you are trying to say here is that you can only have, if you have an electric car, you can only have one vehicle. It doesn't say what happens if you have two vehicles in this at all. Whether you are actually having, because you've got a second vehicle that is a, a normal car, whether you still get your free permit as an electric car. You've actually, you have created so much confusion with your recommendations. Like I said, I've given you four or five scenarios here, and even now, I'm getting, I would suggest this and I would suggest that. Because you can't retrospectively go back, I would have thought, and said to somebody who's got an electric vehicle, run a vehicle, free permit, that six months down the line they say, okay, I, uh, my partner is buying a vehicle, you can't have that permit anymore, and you've got to backdate it and charge it. Because I would imagine you might find yourself in a, in a sticky situation with regards to that. I what, have, what, what I have to admit, I had read it the way I knew it was meant to be. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> and, and I, I didn't even think about that. I, I Chair, can I that, just yes. come in? Come in, come in. The, the paragraph 3.7 says, it is recommended there is no charge for permits for households which only have vehicles powered solar by electricity. Now, that is clear, yes, yeah. but the recommendation under... 2.21, uh, which I think Simon has picked up on. It says the charge permits are changed to allow houses in one vehicle powered solar up to obtain a free permit of charge and to reduce the charger. It doesn't say only one vehicle powered. But on the other hand, 3.7 says vehicles, plural. Does that mean I can have two or three electric vehicles or two or three permits all free? Households, plural, which only have vehicles, plural, powered solely by electric vehicles. It's your interpretation of the English behind it, I guess. But if they're households, you need an, you they're need an they're appendix, plural. to be quite honest, Lynn, and you haven't got that, because I said, they, those recommendations can be interpreted in a variety of different ways, and I would, I would say that you may well have a legal issue if you're interpreting them in one way and, the, and a resident interprets them in the way that I have interpreted that challenges you and says, hold on a minute, I'm having my first permit for 30 quid on my standard diesel car and actually my second vehicle is an electric one, I want my 100 quid permit for free. And I think you find yourself in a mess. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Kevin, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, the, the recommendations were actually uh, clarified by the city solicitor when uh, he was looking at the report. Uh, and the um, process will be clarified in the TRO when we go out to consultation. So what you're saying, so what, sorry, what you're saying then is these are the recommendations that are going to go out. If you're clarifying something, you're potentially rewriting it to make it clearer. So what is being, what you are agreeing to here is the recommendations may not necessarily be the wording that goes out on the legal TRO. If you, want to put that, if you want to put your name to that, Councillor Stagg, I wish you luck. No, I, I see where you're coming from. I'm, and I have to admit, this, this is one of my suggestions, because I said it was all stick and no carrot. So I think we, we need to actually um, reward or, or help people, you know, to, to help them ha have more sustainable transport, etc. So this is where it came from. So I don't know, but what should we, should we take this up, this agenda item out? Can we do that? If you want one, yeah. Want an opposition spokesman's point of view, I would suggest you pull this and get it cleared and come back to another meeting. 
that's what I'm, I'm asking. Um, Joe. It's up to you if you want to take, if you're happy with part of the recommendations, to pass them and come back on the other one. Okay. We, we better wait in for the rest of Councillor Bosch's um, comments, um, because I'm sure there are more to come. <laughs> Let's let's hear your other um comments. So, can I can I come back? I, mean, <clears throat> I think it is unfortunate. I mean, we we didn't get the draft of these reports at the meeting. We literally got them presented to us on the day, so we didn't really get a chance to look at them in in advance. And then only had sorry. No, no, no. The briefing meeting. We didn't. We didn't get these reports. Oh, I'm with you. Yes, yes, The briefing yes. meeting. They were literally presented on the day, so it's quite difficult to follow what was going on. So only when we've had a chance to sort of read this afterwards, and of course, then the chance to ask questions and clarify things would have probably been an opportunity then just to make clear that the recommendations. Because I think if you're, if you had a chance to look at them, you could have. We could have maybe asked some questions about the clarity of the recommendations then, um, because I certainly think that there is potential for us, and and. So, I, so I, I do hope we can we can uh, we can rectify that. I mean, I do I do think the recommendations of reports have to be clear, so that when we leave this room, we know what we decided, and not then walk away and say, oh, we're going to reinterpret it and because it's your decision and it's our decision and it's so we we do need to be clear to it. Um, and, and not wishing to be pedantic, but there are some there are some strange spelling mistakes and grammar things in here, which I think also may have been a result of the rush of getting this done, but um, I won't bother, I won't bother, university I, won't, I won't bother with those at, at this stage, but um, yeah. Um, so no, no I, 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 would, I would agree, I mean, it, it can be interpreted in, in two ways, which just never occurred to me, because I, I suppose, as I say, I was reading it because I knew exactly what was meant, because I was the one who'd, who'd actually suggested it in the first place, so, um, and I didn't think that it could be to interpreted, well, it never occurred to me, it could be interpreted any other way. So, I can defer just this one recommendation, or the whole agenda what, item? Is it the whole CRO? Yeah, you do have another meeting coming up, should you wish to defer. So is that the whole of agenda item 10? Yes, and I think that, that's and sensible. Clarify, you can get more legal advice that Yes, way. and I think um, it needs to go past Councillor Bosha before it goes out next time. Is that fair enough, um, Simon? So we'll, we'll pull this one, um, or defer it until... Um, when is it August the 8th? Yes. Okay. And I think, is that, I think that's, that's the end, yes? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, coming. Thank you, um, Simon and, and Graham. Yeah.